Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our Monday Motivation Spotlight. Another week of Monday Motivation and another challenging week for Ami Swell, as we know. And thank God this time we got through safely and with pride, I might add. So, Baruch Hashem. So, welcome. I'm Leslie Kaplan. Today, we have a great lineup for you, as always. Thank you, of course, to our co-host, ACI, who we're all familiar with. And to our sponsors for the month, Nishika Honey, the bee people spreading sweetness and inclusion one kiss at a time. As you know, the word Nishika in Hebrew means kiss. So what do we have lined up for you today? First of all, as you know, we started this program and this podcast due to the war to give inspiration, ongoing inspiration to us all, as well as to give exposure to individuals, business owners, and organizations who deserve mentioning, and we have many, many more that deserve mentioning. So today we have a fabulous guest who I'm going to add as a spotlight now, who is familiar to many of you, and who I will add is somebody that I wanted to bring on in the very beginning of this series of podcasts, and because he was dealing with different issues, which I won't mention live here on screen, um, he wasn't able to join before, but I'm so happy that he was able to join us now. So let's give an official welcome and introduction to David, Dr. David Leitner, who, as I say, is familiar to many of you. And David, besides being and giving lectures and webinars and workshops on leadership and strategy, he is also the a disabled IDF disabled veteran suffering from CRPS, and he's been an advocate for accessibility and inclusion for over 20 years. He's also the only international practical shooting confederation wheelchair competitor in Israel. Wow, that sounds fascinating, David. So, so I'd like you to share a bit with us as well. And David teaches academically and runs seminars also for the IDF, military preparation academies and more and for companies. So David, you come with a great resume and you know we've happened to have met personally too last year at the uh, Jerusalem Business Conference, which was great. So we're delighted to have you as our guest. So please share with us some inspiration. Tell us who David is, a little bit behind the scenes, anything you'd like that will give our uh, listeners, whether they're joining live or uh, via the recording, some inspiration. Thank you, okay. David. Go for it. <laughs> Thank you very much, Leslie. Okay, so my name is Dr. David Leitner. My students nicknamed me Dr. D about 15 years ago. Um, I am, I empower followership through strategic engagement, which sounds like, what, what does that even mean? And I, I want to sort of give you the origin story of how I got to this idea of followership and how I use it in my life. And hopefully that'll help us really understand a little bit about our own leadership in our lives and also how we engage strategically with, with everything, whether it's our family or in our business and things like that. But Really, how did this all start? Well, in 1995, I graduated from high school and my parents had decided that I was the least prepared of all, like anyone to go to college. I was immature. I needed another year to grow up. And there was a whole bunch of options about what I was going to do. And my dad was like, David, there's a leadership program in, in Israel. And I was like, oh, leadership. It's something I'd always wanted. But because of my immaturity, I, I, I'd never been a leader. Like very clearly, I'd had positions where I was I was the editor of the school newspaper, but I'd never been a leader. I'd never felt leadership. So I went on this program and I fell in love with Israel. When I got back to America, um, I, I got off the plane and I was like, I want to go back. That's it. I I, I want to go back to America. Um, I want to go back to Israel. Please just put me back on the plane. And I'd made a promise to my mother that I would stay for for four years of college, no matter what. Um, so th through that first year of college, every week we had a phone call. And it was just like, hi, how you doing? What's going on? And I ended each of those conversations the same exact way. I said, mom, dad, it it's not so great for me here. I really want to go back to Israel. Bye, click. And I ended every conversation like that, every week, week after week. We get to this summer. I spend three weeks in Cuba as a shaliach for the for the joint. Um, and then I go to summer camp and I'm having a wonderful time. But once again, I, I miss Israel tremendously. So 
you know, con weekly conversations, same thing, same thing. About two weeks before camp is done, um, I'm on the conversation, I'm on, on the call with my dad, and my dad goes, David, listen, you need to come home early. I'm like, why? Is everything okay? Now, my sister had gotten sick when I was in Israel for the year, and uh, I was really, really terrified that like something had gotten gone really, really bad. And like, she, he's like, no, everything's fine. We, we bought you a ticket to Israel. And my jaw hit the floor. I packed faster than a soldier who gets out on a Thursday to get home. And I was like, okay, hop on a plane, get home, repack, get to Israel. And I'm supposed to go to Bar Ilan University for the Opan there and to study Hebrew. And I have no idea where Bar Ilan is. I don't know where I'm sleeping that night. I have no clue where I'm going. I, I, I grab a cab um, to Bar Ilan. I'm sure he took me the long route just to get extra money out of me. Um, and I get on campus and there's nobody there. The campus is an empty. Um, I knock on the door of the dean's office. Nobody there. I knock on the door again. It's dark. The windows are all dark. And then this woman comes up and unlocks the door. And she's like, what are you doing here? We're on vacation for the next two weeks. There's nobody on campus. I um, I was like, I, I was supposed to be starting Opon soon. They go, oh, okay. Come on, let's go. She arranges for me to get into the, the dorms. I spend a few weeks, a few months in Bar Ilan University, and then I moved to Jerusalem. And it was really clear to me that I was I was home. I was home. I was I was exactly where I wanted to be. I was I was enjoying myself in this process of learning to be Israeli and, and being able to go out for food that was kosher and all kinds of fun stuff. But I wanted something more. I wanted I wanted to be like Israeli. I wanted to be part of the culture. I wanted to really feel connected to what it meant to be here. And everyone was telling me, well, if you want to do that, then you got to go into the army. And so I was like, oh, I'm going into the army. I I'm going to the top. I I'm not going to like just be a regular foot soldier. No, no, no. I'm going to be, you know, commando, this Navy SEALs, Air Force. I'm going to be a pilot. And so I ended up doing a whole bunch of tests. And I ended up getting into the Maglan Special Operations Unit. And in Maglan, in this commando unit, I found myself. I was so driven to do, to do more and to do more and, and to constantly push myself further and further. Um, we finished basic training. During basic training, the intifada, the second intifada breaks out. And so we get, you know, in the, we're three months or we're three months in, there's a whole month left and we're already doing guard duty um, in Machane Ofer and in other places and all kinds of, uh, of, of, you know, basic, basic work so that more advanced units can, can go out and do, do their jobs. And um, I, I take this, this, this opportunity and I'm like, okay, I'm going to push myself. Um and we're, we're getting shot at on a regular basis. Like we, there's, there's, people are taking pot shots at us all the time. And, and it was my first experience of both the, the fear of, of being shot at, but the thrill of knowing that I'm doing something which is so super real and, and important and something I be believe in, like deeply, deeply believe in as an important act. We finish basic training. We go on to advanced training. During advanced training, um, one of the exercises we do is called Echad al Echad. It's where you pick someone up on your shoulders and, and you try and run with them as if they're, they're, they've been injured. Um, now, we were doing an exercise before we were going to go out on some missions. Um, and so this exercise was taking place in an urban urban warfare setting. And um, as we're, we're doing the exercise, the, the, the commander says, um, you know, the, to, the, to the Negevist, the heavy gunner, Yo, you you fallen you fallen Patsua, you've been hurt. Um, and then he turns to me and goes, David, pick him up. I run, 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 grab him, put him up on my shoulder, pick up his gun, pick up the other stuff, start running, and then all of a sudden he hit this loud clack in my leg. My leg crumples underneath me, and now he falls, hits his head on the hits his head. Thank God he's wearing a helmet on, on the ground. He starts cursing me out. I, I had no idea the words he was using. Like afterwards, they people were telling me, you, you know what he was calling you, right? I'm like, I have no idea. Um, I, I get up, I get to the wall, and I, I'm not able to walk right. It's, it's my leg is like not holding me right. I, I'm screaming my head off. Get to the safe wall. I, I sit down. They take off my boot. They look at it. And they go, Oh, it's just a sprain. Walk on it. It'll be. It'll be done. It'll be fine. That's that's a Monday. I don't see a doctor until Friday. On Friday, the doctor looks at me and he goes, Ah, it's just a sprain. 
here, have a, a week of, of relaxation um, on base. Now, relaxation on base in my in this unit was do guard duty, run here, run here, do this, take care of that, organize this, make sure this gets down to the people who are doing exercises, all kinds of stuff like that. After that week, we did our first uh, uh, Masa Hachana, which is the preparation route march for getting our berets, our red berets. Um, it was 70 kilometers in the mud. So here I am, my leg is not working right, and I'm going on a 70 kilometer march. And I distinctly remember in the middle of the march, my leg is just burning, burning pain from my ankle up into my knee. And one of my friends, he grabs my hand and he pulls me part of the way. And he, he eventually gets tired, so I pull him. And he pulls me and I pull him. And we get to the end of it. And then two weeks later, we have our our, our long route march to get our berets. And that's 90 kilometers. And there's a tradition in my unit that, you know, 90 kilometers, but your officer gets lost along the way. So we ended up doing 120 kilometers. Um, in the middle of it, they tried to put, to put me on the bus. And it, I stuck off in order to continue. And my leg wasn't working right. We get to the base. Um, we start the, you know, intense unit training. And we were already started working out in the field. Um, and then I get the best message I could have had. They say to me, David, listen, you requested at the beginning of basic training to do sniper school. And you've proven to be an excellent shot. We would love to send you. And I was like, oh, yes, I get to go do this one thing that I wanted to do. And then they say, said to me, and, you know, we're also considering you for officer school, just so you know, but that's going to be down the line. And I was like, oh, my dreams are coming true. My dreams are coming true. This is what I want in my life. My dreams are coming true. Um, I go to, to sniper school. And by the time I get back, it's very clear that I cannot continue with my team. My leg is not working. Right. It's just not working right. Um, I would walk on a pavement. And I would twist my ankle and my leg would crumple under me. In order to run, I would jump, hop twice on my left leg, put my right foot on the ground, just barely touching. And then once again, two hops, two hops, two hops, two hops with my right foot. Um, but I was a sniper and it was the second defada. So I found myself doing a ton of work either as a sniper or as a, a sniper who was training other snipers or shooting a shooting instructor. Um I see a whole bunch of doctors because the first one's like, oh, physical therapy, which I have no time for in the army. And then I see another doctor and he's like, oh, you need surgery. We're going to put three holes in your bones and, and screws and stuff. And then I see another doctor and he goes, six holes in your bones and you're never going to be able to run again. And then I finally see a, a third doctor and he's like, holes in your bones. <laughs> I'm going to take a small set slit on the side of your foot. It'll be fine. I'll, I'll wrap it around the muscle. Everything's going to be great. I'm like, okay, great. So like tomorrow, and he looks at me and says, no, I, I'm going to, uh, uh, to to America for four months to do some training and you're not that bad off. So five, six months from now. So uh, what am I supposed to do between here and there? And he, he looks at me and he goes, go back to the army. I was like, oh, okay. Well, that makes sense to me. I'll go back to the army. Like I'm doing exactly what I want to be doing. Go back to the army, and um, I continue working. I'm, I'm, I find myself in Gilo and a whole bunch of other places. I get to the surgery, and in the surgery, I'm faced with this really interesting, intense problem because I, I, I don't. I'm not asleep, and I, I can feel what they're doing, and it hurts tremendously what they're doing. I can feel the pain. They end up needing to give me like five shots in my leg just to do the surgery. I get out. I'm in a cast. Three months later, when they take the cast off. Um, they, they, they take the cast off and it burns. Now you're not supposed to feel anything when they take a cast off. Like it's, it's supposed to tickle a little bit when they use that bleed. And for me, it's just, just burning intense pain. And then when they start pulling out the stitches in my foot, I, I almost pass out. I throw up all the burger ranch that I ate onto the floor, blah, onto the floor. And, and they're jumping, everyone's jumping up like, what's wrong? What's wrong? What's wrong? I'm like, it hurts. It burns. It burns. It burns so bad. It burns. Physical therapy. I start physical therapy. Intense, intense. Five days a week, physical therapy, trying to make everything okay. Three months later, I see the doctor. He goes, David, there's something wrong here. We need you to see a specialist. Two months later, I see the specialist. And he he has me lie down on the bed. And, and he says to me, close your eyes. 
And all of a sudden, it feels like someone's taking a blowtorch. It's just like on my foot. My eyes fly open. And he's he's tickling my foot with cotton. So he looks at me and he says, David, listen, you have something called chronic uh, regional pain syndrome, CRPS, chronic regional pain syndrome. And I'm like, okay, what is that? And he said, well, it, it's the worst known chronic pain disorder to modern medicine. I said, oh, can you put that into some kind of context for me, please? And he says, sure. So I'm just going to share this with you. Um, if you've ever had a mild headache or sprains or bruises or things like that, right, or fractures, this is what we're talking about. Um, okay, chronic pain, chronic back pain, childbirth with, with training. These are people who, you know, go through a whole, you know, you ladies, I'm sure, understand this. You go through this whole process of learning what it means to give birth and reading exercises and things like that. And you get epidurals, make sure, okay, childbirth without, without, uh, without training or unprepared childbirth where you don't get the epidural. And then there's CRPS. And I'm living my life right here. Constant burning, burning pain. And then there's this added part to it where he goes, yeah, so you've got this constant burning pain, right? And then there's the pain when I touch you, which sort of feels like like an exploding bomb. And he goes, I go, yeah, yes. <laughs> Anything else you want to tell me that's bad about this? And he goes, yeah, David, um, it can spread. And I was devastated. Uh, I had no idea what to do with myself. I went back to the kibbutz where I was staying. And I was all alone. Now, I want you to imagine and think about this for a minute. Here I am facing a whole new reality. I was all alone. Uh, my parents weren't here. I had nobody to help me. Nobody to help me get showered. Nobody to help me deal with stuff. I didn't have normal medical equipment. I wasn't yet recognized as a disabled veteran. So I was getting like super like third hand stuff from people on the kibbutz. Um, I didn't know Hebrew well. My Hebrew was very military level Hebrew. It was, it was, it was good, but it wasn't great. But the worst part about it was because I wasn't with my team anymore and I was basically doing everything on my own, nobody from the army came to visit me. In fact, I lost contact with somebody, with everyone from the army for about 20 years. Um, I'm on the kibbutz um, and uh, one event that just stands out in my head is something which I, I, I feel is important to share. Um, I, I hop my way to, to the bathroom because I can't be bothered to use the crutches. And my left foot got a little bit wet. And so I'm, I'm hopping my way back to my bed, my bed and I slip. My right foot slams down on the ground. And I find myself flat on my back, looking at the ceiling, bawling my eyes out, can't move. And I was this close to saying, that's it. I, I'm done. I can't handle this. Um found out later that CRPS has a nickname called the suicide disease. Um, and I only found some something in myself. I don't know what it was, except that I kept saying, no, I, I can push through this. I, I can, I can push through this. I can continue on. I will, I will find what to do. And I have friends coming to visit me and I had friends who were coming to visit me. And it was, it was, I'm going to get through this. And so I was determined to figure out what I was going to do next. And working with my, my, my doctors, we said, you know what? Really, I really needed to start something, start doing something in my life that was going to drive me forward. So I, I, I went to university. I get to Bar Ilan University, which is where I start, ended up studying. And I, I, I was focusing on strategy. And the, hand, the, the campus wasn't accessible. So I walk into the, the student union office, and this is in 2003. And I say, hi, um, this campus is not accessible change it. And they go, no, you change it. And I go, okay, what does that mean? And they made me the uh, representative for the disabled on campus through the student union. I ended up spending the next 10 years on campus working on making it completely accessible, not just physically accessible, but also accessible for people with learning disabilities, and making sure people could, could get Get on, get into university if they weren't able to do the normal track of, you know, bagot and, and psychometric exams. Um, I was the first accessibility advisor at Bar on any campus. This was at Bar Ilan University. I was the first ac accessibility advisor on any campus in, in the country. Um, 
And I learned a really important lesson there. And it started uh, me on a track that I didn't even know I was going to go on. But it goes back to the leadership. I found out that there's a real difference between being like a position leader, someone who's been given command of something or responsibility. I'm responsible for handicapped accessibility on campus and leadership. You know, because I was responsible for it, I had some authority. I was able to speak with some authority, but nobody was going to follow me just because I told them to, because I'm the accessibility advisor. In fact, people would say to me, why do I have to make my uh, my event accessible? There's not going to be any handicapped people at my event. And I would go, that's not the point. If we want to change this, if we want to make this a norm that we are accepting and inclusive, then we have to make everything accessible and inclusive. And so I learned that leadership is really a process. It's a process of bringing people together with different ideas and getting them to follow some sort of process, some sort of strategic process towards a vision, towards an idea, something bigger than themselves. And it's about communicating the different objectives and goals and, and helping people align and bring their best self to that process. And I needed to do that in the Aguda. And I needed to do that with all of the people who were responsible for making the university accessible. And as I started going through this process, I learned that I had a cognitive bias because I was only doing this based on my own perspective of my disability. And then I found out that there are people who don't have arms, and there are people who are blind, and there are people who are deaf. And so slowly the, the vision that I had for what this meant expanded and got much bigger. During this time, I went through a whole bunch of different surgeries. Um, on my back, I ended up having a spinal cord stimulator put in, and then I had an epidural put in first. For six months, that didn't work. I had five surgeries on my back to put a spinal cord stimulator in my back. Um, and throughout this process, I, I finished my BA and I start doing a direct PhD. Some of the professors had said to me, David, guess what? We don't want you to do an MA, do a direct PhD, it'll be great. And I, I, I'm studying leadership in the international arena and I come across this concept called followership. And as I'm hearing this, I'm thinking to myself, Wow, when I was in the army, I was a diehard follower. I was the one who was so dedicated to the ideas and so dedicated to the concepts that I was pushing for that I was willing to give it all. And there are different kinds of followers out there, you know, and learning about the different kinds of followers and applying it, you know, in, in, in the international arena, I learned that there's way more to leadership than there is just, I have a position or I have authority or I have an idea and I'm going to drive us towards it. It's about understanding who your followers are and what it is they're capable of bringing to the table. And so I'm finishing my PhD and I start getting this tingling in my left leg. Now I'd only been on crutches up until then. And all of a sudden I start feeling this, this tingling in my left leg. I'm seeing the doctors and they're like, David, we don't know. One night I wake up in the middle of the night screaming my head off. I had thrown up. I was sweaty and gross. My wife, who is seven months pregnant, jumps up. Dude, what's going on? What's going on? We gently pull the uh, the blanket off my off my left leg, and my left leg is swollen, and it looks like it's a balloon that's been punctured, and it's blue, and it's purple, and it's gross. And it's like, okay, what, what am I going to do now? I go and I shower, and I'm faced with a whole new reality. Here I am. I was a disabled veteran on crutches. Now I'm a disabled veteran in a wheelchair. What, what am I going to do? And I'm like, well, I'm not going to let this stop me. I finished my PhD. And I look for the next big thing that I want to start doing on campus. And I said, you know what? It's very important for me to make it easier for people who want to come and study here to study in Israel in English. And so working with the dean's office, we opened up international BA programs. We started with three programs. We moved to four, and by the time I was done in 2018, we had six international BA programs running on Barlon, at Barlon University. And I learned that if I can get people to ascribe to the ideas that I find to be important, and they see them as important, it will drive us forward. It will help us understand and work together, and it will create a strategic process that I, as the leader, and them as the followers, will all see as as, as a mutual thing we're doing together. And so I'm driving driving through this, and, it, and in like 2016, one of my students comes up to me and says, Dr. D, listen, um, I'm leaving the, the pro program. Now, I was very opposed to anybody leaving the program, 
and she looks at me and says, well, well, um, um, she says, no, no, you don't understand. I, I want to go into the army. And I was like, oh, well, in that case, fine. How can I help you? And she, um, she ends up going into the army. Um, and about two months into her army service, she calls us and goes, um, Dr. D, I'm in this kibbutz in the middle of nowhere when I get home and it's boring and I don't know anybody and I don't know what to do. And I was like, well, uh, okay, let me talk to my wife. Speak to my wife. And I say, hun, um, would you be willing to have a chayelet bodeda in our house? And she goes, absolutely. We take our, our spare room, empty it out. I call Sariba back and I say, hi, you're coming to be our, our chayelet bodeda. I'm coming to pick you up. <laughs> Hop into my Jeep, go down. Throw, they throw all of their, her stuff into my car, take her back. And she became part of our family. Um, and this was sort of the, the idea, like, oh, finding new ideas, new, new, new things that I could pay it forward. So I also found an organization called Restart, which was which helped me work towards, you know, building a shield for my legs. And once they once I was part of that organization, it was like, well, this organization is designed around helping disabled veterans get what they need in order to live a full life, get them back on the track of life, mentoring programs. And and uh, a makers program for for creating things that you, you know you can't buy on the on the open market. And I realized that there is so much more to what I want to give. So I started tell, tell, telling my story like I'm telling here a little bit longer. Normally I get about an hour, and I ended up getting invited um, by my Sinatnif game to come to give a talk at um, the commando school. And she had reconnected me with some of the guys from my unit um, after 20 years. And I gave that talk. And the message I gave was really simple. You need to be a shaliach. You need to take some ideas. If you want to be a leader, if you want to be a good follower, grab onto some ideas and act in agency for those ideas. Make them the ideas that you espouse every single day. Show the world what it is that you stand for and work for it. Create your own world. That shlichut, that, that, that agency that you're taking, it's a driving force. It, it makes people want to follow, and it makes, makes leaders understand how much you ascribe and are willing to participate in their process and in the, in the, in the vision that they've created for the world. So, you know, really, there's two questions. It's what ideas are you prepared to fight for as you create your world? But more important, what ideas are you willing to live for as you create your world? That's what followership and leadership's all about. Oh, and Leslie, just to mention the shooting, in 2017, I started participating in international in, in shooting competitions. Not stand there and go poop, poop, poop shooting. It's move around, shoot, 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 move around, shoot, 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 move around, shoot, shoot, shoot. Um, and I had a goal for myself. I'm never allowed to come in in the bottom third. And I'm competing against perfectly able-bodied people who can run and jump. And I have never come in in the bottom third. That was my goal. And I compete internationally. In fact, in May, I'm supposed to go to, at the end of May, please no war, um, I'm supposed to be going to, uh, to Greece for an international competition to represent Israel. So aim high. You know, aim high when you're shooting, aim high in your life. That's, you know, change your world. That's my, that's well, what I wish for David, you David, you are such an inspiration. And that is the idea of this program, to have inspiring people for whatever they do. And we've had many inspiring people here, each one with their different angle. So thank you so much, Dr. David <laughs> Leitner, for not only sharing your story with us, but for also being a total inspiration and showing us that you are a leader and that, yes, we can't always control the outside situation and what happens to us, but we can totally control our reaction and not only the way that we react, but the way that you've dealt with inclusion and making things happen. And that is what makes our world different when people make things happen. So Dr. David Leitner, thank you so much for being our guest today and for being totally inspiring. And I'm sure that there's many, many things that we, the listeners, whether you joined live 
or whether you joined via the recording and you're listening to this, that you can take back from David's message. So thank you so much. Thank you also, and don't log off yet, I have an announcement. Thank you so much also to our co-hosts, ACI, and to our sponsors, Nishika Hani. So, ladies and gents, we have around the corner Pesach. So for the next two weeks, we will not be having a live Monday Motivation Spotlight. Next Monday is Erev Chag, and then the following Monday is Pesach. So we will be meeting again in two weeks' time, Monday, May the 6th, which is Yom HaShoah, Holocaust Memorial Day. We will be meeting on that day, and we have a very, very inspiring guest who is appropriate for the actual day. So please make sure you join us, put it in your calendars, and make sure you join us if you're not a regular. So we look forward to you actually putting it in your calendar every single week. So wishing all of you and Am Yisrael a safe time, a time where we can have growth, and wishing us a chag kasher v'sameach. Thank you again to David, our wonderful, inspiring guests. And Am Yisrael Chai, look forward to seeing you again in two weeks' time. And bye-bye for now. Am Yisrael Chai.